Here we go. Well, thank you so much, um, Gail, for that um, warm invitation. And I um, am excited about all the work that you guys are doing um, for, for training and building capacity. And, and, and I know Yvonne and I are really excited to talk with you a little bit today about um, the role of OT and PT in capacity building. Um, and, and as you said, Gail, I'm, um, I'm on the East Coast and um, at, in uh, the southeastern corner of Virginia. And um, what's been really cool about this collaboration um, that Yvonne and I have been doing over the last numbers of years is that we, um, we, we represent, you know, like you said, each, each of our coasts, but it's really given us access to so many people. And, um, and having those kinds of conversations with folks about, um, you know, the work that they're doing in schools has given us a, a, a really, um, I think, solid foundation in developing the quality indicators that we'll talk about next time, but also thinking about all of the steps and processes that are required for, for building capacity. So, um, so thank you very much for the invitation to be here. Well, welcome. <laughs> I would, oh, I was just going to say, I would echo what you're saying, Patty, and I, I've gotten the, I've had the privilege of speaking with this group several times, and I just appreciate not only this time, but the, I'll tell you, you'll get questions afterwards, so, but really thoughtful emails and questions afterwards, and I just think um, the framework that's been built in, in Oregon, and I know there's people from other states that participate in this really is um, valuable for our professions and thinking about what we do in the schools. So um, yeah, so I think we could go ahead and um, get, get started. And I'll just, cause Patty's taking, starting off, I'll just say, um, this is something that's really near and dear to my heart because I think sometimes we, um, we settle for less than what we can do in the schools. And so really how do we build capacity is not necessarily about how do we expand our roles per se, but how do we walk into the roles that have already been defined for us? So I hope that get the kind of, we're able to give you some tools to think about that. So I am gonna get us started. And, um, and as we talked about earlier, um, we have obviously some, um, explicit information to share. Um, but at the same time, we want to, we really do want to be conversational. So if you have thoughts or questions or, um, you know, ideas to share, we certainly will, um, you know, pop, please feel free to pop those in the chat box or, or however you, um, however you want to structure that. And um, we're going to um, you know, kind of organize ourselves around sharing this info, but then open up for conversations or as we as we certainly go along. But um, so what we want to talk about today are really kind of what are what are the resources? How do we use those resources, including the evidence that's available to us to build capacity in schools? And um, and what I've learned already about your organization is how connected you are to identifying those resources and building your own capacity so that we're, um, you know, enhancing, we're achieving the best out outcomes for our clients as we can. So we're gonna talk about um, the benefits of gathering, evaluating, summarizing, and sharing relevant best available evidence with our teams, um, both to advance our own practice, but also to improve the decision-making that we're making with our, um, with our school teams. And then we hope to share a little bit about a story that we have um, experienced describing kind of a knowledge pathway that we developed um, that involves integrating a lot of different resources, a lot of different um, types of sources to really build our own capacity and improve client outcomes. So we're gonna start with a little bit of a background um, about sort of how, where we are in the context of um, of our accessibility and synthesis of high quality evidence and, and all of those sources of evidence um, that we have available to us. And, and, and I think some of this information isn't going to necessarily be surprising. Um, I think though it's important to understand it so that we can come to um, a, a place, sort of a launching pad, if you will, of what, what those important steps are 
that we need to take next. So we know that there has been ex really kind of an explosion of high quality research that's available to us. Um, we, uh, we know that there is research out there that addresses the effectiveness of intervention and outcomes within the scope of OT and, and certainly PT practice. Um, there are a number of journals that are available that are dedicated specifically to occupational and physical therapy practice. For children and youth, we've seen um, some really um, interesting intersectional journals as well that's looking at the ways that OTs and PTs are working together to, to produce those really good, strong outcomes for students. Um, there are practice guidelines that are available through our professional organizations, our professional associations that really um, address pediatric practice across practice settings. And of course, we have now, you know, just loads of texts and um, books and, and so forth that really talk about what does best practice look like for occupational and physical therapy? Um, so we've, we, we've you know, been exposed to all of this new and really rich and dynamic information, yet I think what we hear, you know, we experience ourselves in our own practice and we hear from practitioners is that we continue to really struggle to find ways to apply that relevant practical evidence that guides practice and you know, across practice settings, but certainly within schools um, to really help us figure out what are the specific performance issues that we need to be looking at relative to the specific life circumstances of our students. So we're in this place where we're really just trying to kind of balance. And we know yet that there are some significant gaps in, um, in what is known and what we regularly use in practice. I think, you know, Echo Ties is, is, such, a, is such a great place, such a great um, opportunity that you all have to come together to try to figure out how can we close that gap? What are some of the pathways that we can use to, um, to close that gap? But we know that those gaps exist and that they, that they really do impact our practice um, outcomes, and what we, what we know from both the literature and from our own practice is that, is that sometimes these gaps cause us to adopt um, interventions, adopt approaches that might you know, be, be premature. We might overuse some that aren't well supported by the literature. Um, it could cause us to deliver unnecessary care, sometimes suboptimal care, um, and, and we often don't miss those opportunities. Um, so the gap really results in, in issues around satisfaction, cost effectiveness, practitioner credibility, if I'm not able to really meet those demands of high quality care that produce replicable replicable and consistent results, I'm not going to really be a very credible uh, professional in the context of, of um, my practice. Um, and then it causes that mismatch that we've already talked about a little bit around, um, you know, what does, what does practice um, look like in terms of um, how it's described in, in the evidence versus what it looks like in, in our day-to-day -day work. So, so what, um, what we're talking about is we need to sort of figure out ways, pathways, effective pathways to close that gap. We want to be able to, uh, to bring what is known um, and what is happening in practice, what is used in an everyday um, way together. Um, when, and when we do that, we know that the effectiveness of our service delivery improves, our clients progress, our outcomes improve, they participate more in the things that are meaningful to them, into their effective roles, their effective um, uh, activities that they want to be able to engage in, and, and everyone around them, that whole ecosystem is is more satisfied. Our, you know, the client is satisfied because they can do the things that they want to do at, at, in, the, you know, in the context in which they want to do them. Their families are more satisfied. The teams are more satisfied. And, and, and lo and behold, we are more satisfied, right? Because we 
we can see those outcomes. We can see the value of the service delivery that we're providing. So by closing that gap, um, I think we 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 become sort of more um, more in touch with our professional identities and um, and feel more um, satisfied with those identities. And and what I have seen in my practice over the last numbers of years, decades, really, um, is that. One of the main efforts that we have seen, we've put a lot of resource and effort into um, into, uh, this pathway is to really kind of focus on research literacy. So I I know we've seen a lot of that coming out of AOTA, we've seen a lot of it coming out of APTA, that if we just focus on really building our research literacy skills, we're going to be better at closing that gap. Um, and so, and we've, we've seen that to some extent that we recognize that the better we are at really looking at research and understanding research, um, and understanding the outcomes that are described in research, then we can have a, you know, kind of a, a stronger stance, a stronger, um, uh, ability to recognize what we need to do with our clients. So, so we've done that. Um, we've, 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 hunkered down, we've tried to sort of figure out and built a lot of tools and resources just around building um, our research literacy. But it still has been really difficult. Um, You know, like I said in the beginning, we've seen this exponential increase in the amount of information that's out there. And so it's been really hard still, even with all this great, um, these great skills in research literacy to to be able to kind of effectively close the gap. And so what we're really starting to see is that closing that gap requires much more than just those traditional research um, literacy skills that we initially identified. And, um, And we think that we need to not only have skills in research literacy, we also need to be able to be effective knowledge translators or knowledge brokers maybe um, in order to close the gap. And, and I'm again so impressed by the work that you guys are doing with Echo Ties and all of your um, opportunities to, to build those knowledge translation skills in order to close that gap. So I think, you know, if I had to kind of define it, I, I would think about it in terms of those skills that we use to kind of gather information, evaluate that information, summarize it in order to um, to align it specifically with what I'm doing in practice. Um, and I think we've gotten pretty good at that piece. Uh, but the second piece uh, of knowledge translation is I think it's that two-way process. It's not only, um, you know, kind of being a consumer of that information, but utilizing that information and and recognizing and communicating where the gaps continue to exist. Um, And so these kinds of conversations where we're talking about evidence and how we're using evidence and where it falls, how it supports us and where it falls short can be really, really effective, I think, in, um, in closing the gap. So this is just an age old definition of knowledge translations come out of the Canadian Institutes of Health and Rehabilitation. Um, And really just again, sort of talks about how we are taking in that information, applying information through evidence, and then translating it out to our teams, to our families. Um, And also again, sort of sharing that back with, with the developers and and becoming a part of that that um, that process of developing knowledge um, of our of our practice. So, so knowledge translation. I don't know how familiar you are with the concept of knowledge translation. Um, what what makes knowledge translation a little tricky for us is that. Um, it has a lot of different names and you'll see it listed in a lot of different ways in the literature. Um, We chose knowledge translation because it's sort of, um, 
it's sort of emerging, I think, as sort of the front runner, if you will, in some of these, um, these descriptions. But we've seen it listed things like diffusion of knowledge, knowledge exchange, research implementation, knowledge dissemination, et cetera. Um, but again, I think whatever you call it, the bottom line is that it is, um, it is that process by which we take in information from a lot of different sources and translate it in a way that makes it accessible for ourselves and our entire teams um, for the purposes of really decision making. Um, so there are, we know that there are some barriers to knowledge translation um, around which we may continue to struggle. Um, there's, a, again, this, um, this explosion of information um, and, and, and that, that's becoming sort of really much more salient, much more relevant on, on the forefront. Um, but it's sometimes hard to appreciate all of the sources of evidence that we have available. And in my very first slide where we talked about journals and practice guidance, um, uh, books and texts, and but also there's all of those other um, kind of um, internal resources like our own practice knowledge and the practice knowledge of our teams, et cetera, that we're really trying to get a, get a full sense for. Um, we can also have difficulties in accessing the research. Um, I know, you know, for many of the folks that I talk to, again, getting our hands, it, it, it might be emerging, but getting our hands on some of that research is, is, has been challenging for some of us. It takes time. It, a time is a huge barrier for many of us with regard to knowledge translation. Um, and then the other thing that I think we hear a lot about is that a lot of the research that's becoming available to us is either done, you know, it might be labs, um, it might be done and the research might be conducted in a, in a setting that's not uh, like ours. It might be done in a setting that doesn't um, have the same kinds of legislative restrictions that we do in the context of our work. Um, our, you know, policies may be different, et cetera. So sometimes it's hard to translate, to make that sort of find that dovetail fit between what was done in that research lab and what we're trying to produce and, um, and emulate in our, in our practice setting. Um, and then we also have, you know, uh, these contexts where it's sometimes hard to, to change, right? It's hard to change practice in some of our settings and bringing in new ideas and bringing in, um, new approaches, there, there may be some sort of resistance against that. Um, and then, you know, I think some of the other barriers just kind of quickly is I think sometimes we have a perception that there's just, there's not the, enough evidence out there to find, um, and particularly not evidence that's unique to my setting. Um, we often find that some of, that much of the research, um, it's, it's, it's changing now. I think we're seeing more and more um, more and more sort of participation focused research, but um, a lot of times uh, we get exposed to the research that's deficit focused and that's been kind of hard, I think, to apply and, and translate in our settings. Um, we, might, we might again um, sort of rely on those practice patterns that we know, they're, they're tried and true, we love them, they feel really great, we get the results we, we want, um, so it's hard to sort of change out of that. And, um, and, and sometimes, and I don't, you know, I don't have the right exact words for this, but I think we, I, I kind of summed it up as we fail to detect the signposts, right? And I know for myself and how I sort of frame that in my own practice is I'll be chugging along and doing the work that I know in my heart is really, really good. And I don't often think, oh, you know what? I should probably go look at the literature to, to validate this work that I'm doing. So I think, you know, there might be something new out there, there might be something new on the horizon, or there might be some important conversations to be had about practice, but I don't always, um, I, you know, notice when, um, when I need to make a practice change. Um, and again, that's sort of just a, a natural um, artifact of, of us becoming more uh, skilled therapists. 
So, um, but, uh, you know, in Converse, there's also a lot of important um, facilitators for knowledge translation. Um, and I think one of the major facilitators that we are, we are noticing more and more available in the literature are, are called knowledge pathways, knowledge translation pathways. And what these pathways do, just like any other, um, you know, roadmap, any other pathway that we might we might take, um, you know, Google Maps or whatever. Um, they tell us how we can effectively get from one place to the next. And so, um, so the facilitators of knowledge translation pathways that we've identified are those pathways that really help us strengthen our practice reflection competencies. So the more effective we are at reflective practice, the better we are going to be able to translate information. Um, we also think that um, an important pathway includes opportunities to think not only about all of that external evidence, all of the research or whatever it might be that's out there that's emerging, um, but also what we know to be true within ourselves. So our own internal sources of evidence and be able to kind of blend those two and give equal um, credence and equal weight to those two to, uh, to kind of move forward. Um, another, I think key important component for a knowledge translation pathway is when it enables us to really think deeply and include in those components of evidence are um, our clients' values and interests um, and hold those with equal weight to our own internal uh, sources of evidence and those external sources of evidence. And then of course, we can't step away from our own context, right? Being able to really um, situate all that within whatever is going on in terms of our um, our, our practice, where our practice is taking place, and, um, and that, that unique context in which we're, we're functioning. So, um, so I think what we've seen um, over time is this transition um, to really thinking about building our competencies in research literacy, right? That enabled us to really think about what the research is that's out there, how we, how we can understand those, how we can interpret it, but it it alone didn't really help us translate that to practice. So then we sort of had moved along the sequence to really um, focusing on the evidence, um, figuring out what does that evidence say and how are we going to use that evidence to guide our practice. And I think where we are finding ourselves today is at this place of knowledge translation where we're really integrating not just those you know, that external evidence, those articles, that, that research that, um, that we are increasingly exposed to, but all those other pieces, right? Our own internal knowledge and commitments and, and skills, our clients, our contexts, as well as our evidence. So we're, we're kind of, we've kind of seen this shift in how we can um, effectively build capacity by considering all of those components. So I think closing the gap um, is it's, um, it's, it's that synthesis, the closing the gap really is relying on our ability to synthesize a lot of different information across all of these um, dimensions in a way that really enables us to be more predictable about client outcomes. And as we talked about earlier, the more predictable we can be, the more um, effective we can be at producing those replicable um, results, the better um, our, the more we and our clients are satisfied. And of course, we reduce the costs of um, at the economic costs and all of the other costs um, related to um, ineffective service delivery. So I think, and sort of I think where Yvonne and I are, is that these, as we've made this shift from just, just trying to be better um, 
better able to understand research to now really focusing on these knowledge translation pathways, that's actually enabling us to be better absorbers of evidence and better appliers of the evidence that's out there and available to us. So um, I think, you know, what we are, are going to talk about next is that there are a number of important knowledge translation tools and resources that are available to us through, um, through professional development training, our practice mentorship opportunities, collaborative learning opportunities, journal clubs, et cetera. Um, and it's important for us to take advantage of as many of those tools and resources as we can. And, um, I, but I think again, what seemed relevant to us is to find this pathway forward. So I'm gonna turn it over to Yvonne. She's gonna talk um, a little bit about our story and how we found ways to, um, to really address the, the gaps and utilize some of these strategies. Thanks, Patty. So, um, um, you know, the background that Patty just gave you is really important to understand because I think there's still a lot of discussion and, and um, some of the school districts I've even worked with a lot of um, adherence to the research based practices, the research aspect of, of knowledge translation and um, you know, Barbara Hooper talks about who, what's your knowledge communities? Who's your knowledge communities? How are you building your knowledge communities? And, and I think that's been a lot of the discussion that Patty and I have had as we've been really trying to think about how do we think about school-based practice? And um, we've spent a lot of time looking at models of reflection, um, think, really thinking through professional reasoning. How do we think as, um, as practitioners? Um, there's a whole body of literature in what they call mind lines that we've been reading where they've realized that um, this kind of what we've had historically is here's the research and here's how we should translate it to practice isn't really how we think as professionals. So, so what do we do with this? How do we then utilize appropriate resources, including research as a resource that build these knowledge, uh, our knowledge translation pathways, but also help us to really build our capacity to really work to the full um, extent of what our role is within the settings that we're in, in, in this situation situation within school-based practice. Um, and how do we do that to help really support our decision-making, not only independently, but also then how do we communicate that to other stakeholders that also help with that capacity building? So we really started thinking about, all right, what, what is capacity building and what does it look like? And um, we started thinking about our practice, you know, how do we, how do we use knowledge to um, impact our individual practice, but then also how do we leverage and strengthen the capacity of our teams? How does this work within the context of the collaboration that we do within the schools, um, our clients? And you know, what knowledge do we have regarding our clients' context and environment, um, occupational profile, um, um, physical performance, all of those different um, aspects of our client that we need to be taking into consideration and also the environment. How does the context or the environment that we're in impact our, um, our knowledge translation and our capacity building within our settings? So with that, we really started thinking about a knowledge translation pathway for school-based practice. And um, within the context of that, thinking about how that then builds our capacity. And when we're talking, it's not capacity building in our minds is not just about um, we get to do more. That's really not, not the intent. The intent is how do we better maximize our skills and our expertise as occupational physical therapists in order to um, help the students that we serve really be prepared for what life is going to look like beyond school. And, and it's very, it's very complex. Um, 
as I was reviewing these slides, I'm working through with my students at the university in a pediatrics course, an adolescent case. And we've been talking a lot about what influences our practice, which is the same thing of what are these knowledge um, translation pathways that helps us determine what are going to be the best interventions, what are gonna be the best steps with this particular case that we're working on. And, um, we're dealing with a lot of the same types of things that are here, really thinking about reflecting on our practice, reflecting on what we know, um, applying it, thinking about um, actionable steps, thinking about how we can overcome some of the um, barriers. Or another way I, I talk about this and think about this is how do we maximize the strengths of our teams or maximize the strengths um, within the, the environments context we're in and minimize some of the challenges. Because some of those barriers we may never fully um, um, be able to get rid of. And so we don't want to put all of our attention at trying to decrease the barriers. If we put our attention at maximizing our strengths, some of those barriers are going to go away. And thinking about external evidence. So we're gonna look at um, these, our next um, set of slides do have a little bit more words on them, partially because we wanted to give you a tool to be able to go back to and reflect on um, as you think about what might be your um, pathway. But um, we, the more we've read, the more we've worked on quality indicators, the more we've looked at professional development, um, Reflection is really a key aspect um, that we really need to reflect on and take stock in the capacity assets and engage in the full scope of our practices as a defined by our national um, organizations. And um, I think it's really difficult to find time to actually stop and, and reflect. And, and if you even just think over your past week in, in um, practice, have you had an opportunity to really stop and reflect on, this is what I did with this student. Did it work? Did I get to where I wanted to be? Am I moving, moving in, in towards the goals that we've established? All those aspects of reflection. And if not, how am I gonna change? What am I gonna do? Or do we wait until, that annual review or the quarterly report cards and we do a really quick reflection and go, yep, they're making progress and that's it. So really being thinking about reflecting on our um, practice and reflecting on our role as being agents of change and not just within the context of um, we, we should be addressing ABC as an OT or as an PT, but also agents of change within the context of um, schools as a whole. What is it looking like as kids come back to school after this pandemic? And I know at the beginning of this school year, I was with you all and we were talking about, you know, what, is it, what, what does it mean that kids have to wear masks at school? And what about those kids with sensory issues? And so how are we functioning within the, the changing environment that we find ourselves? Okay, next. And so when we're reflecting on a pr practice and really taking that time for ourselves, a question we might think about is, what do I know and what do I need to know to be able to advance my practice or to be able to advance my skills. And then thinking about some of the um, tools and resources that might be um, available. And um, one of the projects that Patty and I were just a part of and that will soon be available is a special issue uh, with a journal where we actually took um, some research articles and then um, small groups did some analyses of these articles. So there's a there's a tool at the end of every article that kind of walks through what we're walking you through right now in really, in really rethinking about maybe those of us who are editors of journals need to rethink how we are even presenting some of this information to help facilitate some of these knowledge translation pathways. But thinking about how to use the tools and resources that are available to you. And again, with Echo Ties, you guys, have so much available. And I go back and look at those recordings quite often. In fact, I'm getting ready to do a lecture on um, feeding and swallowing. And I'm like, I think I know where I'm gonna go do some research on some recorded um, lessons. So, but taking advantage of that. And then 
after we've thought about ourselves, we also need to be thinking about the teams that we're working with. And what are some of the assumptions, values, and processes that guide our teams? Do we need to change some of our team, the ways our teams work? Um, do, do we need to um, strategically engage in more collaborative learning and, and um, shared um, decision making across team members so that we're sharing some of that database decision making and we're um, sharing some of our knowledge with, with each other? Um, a reflection question that we could um, ask is, um, what information can I share with and learn from the team to support practice change? And um, we, we do have a lot in here about change or thinking about um, the future of practice because I do think we're in a time of, of some adjustments of what is happening within school-based practice. Just the fact of coming back from the pandemic has changed some of our practice and what we need to do. Um, but really, again, um, take advantage of some of the tools and resources. If you, the National Center for Knowledge Translation is a great um, place to go where they're really encouraging um, researchers um, to think about resources other than a scholarly article in a scholarly journal. What are other ways that we can do some of our knowledge translation, blogs, um, insiders' perspectives, having clients share their um, lived experience, some of those types of things. Um, and some of those are available in that Center for Knowledge Translation to be looking at and exploring. But how do we build this within the team? And then thinking about our clients' needs and what are some of the um, challenges facing our clients? And are there some biases or, or ethical um, decision-making strategies that we need to be thinking about as we work with our clients? How can we be more collaborative in working with our, um, our students in gathering data, making decisions and implementing interventions? Um, again, as I was reflecting on this, and again, this adolescent case that we're doing right now in, at the university, I'm like, one of the points that I keep making over and over again with our students is we can't wait till they're 16 to be thinking about their transition plan. With those of you who work in preschool, we need to be thinking about and collaborating with our clients to be th and the team that we're working with to be thinking about elementary and middle school and high school and life beyond um, beyond school. So, um, so really thinking about some of those things around um, clients' needs. And, and sometimes we have that discussion of wants versus needs, right? Where you'll have this, well, we want to, do, to pursue this type of intervention. And we as therapists then need to do that. Um, I often think of it as a therapeutic dance with our clients in helping to, to work with their wants, but also think about some of their needs. Because it's really hard if you work mainly in preschool or elementary school to have some of the discussions about adolescence with families but we want to be thinking about some of that. We don't want to teach a child how to safely cross the street the day they need to be able to do that. We need to be thinking about some of those um, um, skills early on and thinking about um, what are some of the unique needs of these students that we serve and then what tools and resources do we have to deliver um, those services. And then we want to be thinking about the environment and the context within which we um, we work. And I, if you've heard me talk, you you know that I'm a big proponent of let's get out of our therapy spaces, let's get out of our therapy room, let's work within the natural context and environment um, that the student encounters throughout their school day. So are we in PE? Are we at recess? Are we in the lunchroom? How many of you are willing to sit and eat your lunch in the lunchroom with all the other kids? Personally, I can barely handle being in the lunchroom when I'm working with a kid around a particular um, need between all the, all the sensory issues, the noise, the smells, everything that's happening, all the distractions. And we're asking our kids to be able to um, eat lunch, which is really important for brain health, for learning. Um, 
Often, I don't know where it's, what it's like in your state, we still have a lot of schools in our state where, let, where they eat lunch before they get recess. Um, and there's actually data out there that is supporting that you have recess first and then you eat lunch. Because kids who have um, lunch before recess are rushing through their lunches and not eating enough because they want to get outside to play. And so really rethinking um, what are some of the potential barriers within our environment? How can we leverage and create a culture of evidence-based practice within our settings around contextual factors that support student participation and support the best um, outcomes for students? Um, and how do our practice environments and experiences influence um, what we're doing and how we're utilizing um, evidence. And when we use the term evidence, we're not just talking about a large, you know, randomized controlled study research, um, but we're talking about all the different sources of evidence that um, support our decision making. Um, and then um, there's the external evidence um, or thinking about the research that's out there. And I would encourage you to figure out ways to um, have some exposure to research and have some exposure to some of the, the evidence that's coming out. Um, IDEA asks us to use the best available research um, in decision-making with our practice, but the Department of Ed also recognizes that and has explicitly stated that we can use emerging and promising practices. So those things that are emerging and promising and we use good database decision-making, we, we still can be able to um, do some of that. But how do you ask questions and how do you utilize um, some of the evidence to build your knowledge knowledge and your capacity to make better decisions on behalf of the students that you serve. And both of our professional organizations, um, APTA and AOTA have summarized some of the evidence for us. We certainly can use some of that. They have some practice guidelines out for us, but how many of you have read a summary and gone, yeah, but I serve Johnny over here and this, does, this wouldn't work for him. So we need to be critical um, evaluators of that evidence and then think strategically how we're applying some of that to the students that we're working with. Um, if you're near a university, but now with, um, with what we've learned through the pandemic, if there's anything, if I have to say one of the positives um, in this whole pandemic is that it's taught us some really great strategies to be connected um, with each other. And so it used to be, if you live by a university, work with university students to get some of your questions answered or to think about your interventions. Well, our students now are answer, at the University of Puget Sound are answering questions for clinicians all over the country. And so I think if you have questions that you would like answered regarding your practice, um, or, or want some research evidence around a particular strategy related to a particular aspect of practice, I'd be reaching out to universities and finding out if they have a way to collaborate with you. Um, if you can certainly reach out to me and I'll get you connected with our person at our university. I'm sure as Patty's program gets up and going, they'll be looking for questions. And students do way better work when they're doing a real project than some, that they know is going to be used than something that um, has just been um, offered to them as a, from a faculty member to do. And I just want to add in here, Yvonne, that um, the more questions we, we collectively raise, um, the better our evidence becomes because, uh, you know, Every time I ask a question, it sort of facilitates a somebody's thinking around. Oh, there must be a gap there. So, um, so I think you know the beauty of knowledge translation is it enables us to to work in both directions to share to be able to utilize the information that's out there that's already available to us, but also to direct a little bit of um, the evidence that's being formed. Um, so, yeah, be sure to ask those questions. <coughs> So 
quick, like I said, there's lots of words on those slides that I just went through. So you could go back and reflect. I mean, where within your knowledge translation pathway, maybe what really resonated with you is, boy, I need to build some reflection into my practice. Then take some time and think about how to do that and work with each other, encourage each other in that. Or maybe you need to figure out some other strategies to get that client's lens, or maybe it's working with your team. Um, it's certainly not a linear um, process. So I know we presented it as yourself and then the team and then the client and, and the environment, but it, you, can, you can jump in at any point um, within that pathway. And it becomes, I think, a much more iterative and um, interactive process um, to go through. But what we're, we're really looking at then is how can we apply the best practices as we're building our capacity, as we're thinking about what we're doing in the schools um, in order to really have effective decision-making to improve the outcomes of the students that we're seeing and to increase um, the, stake, the capacity of our other stakeholders as well. Um, because then that allows for improved participation uh, for our students across contexts within their school environment, thinking about life um, beyond school. It also allows for improved um, 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 client quality of outcomes. And I would say too, you know, I often think about when I think about my client and when I'm working in the schools, I often think that I have two. One is the student that I'm actually working with, but my other client is the school system, that school district that I'm working with. And how am I making decisions that's in the best interest of that school district? And if our students are making progress and if we're being um, as um, uh, efficacious as we can, then we're also helping our school district be um, efficacious in the services that they're providing. And it could end up with some cost savings um, for them. And it also increases the confidence and the value of our OT and PT services. And I'll tell you, people are asking the question, what is the value added of having an OT or a PT here? Why would I, why do I need an OT or PT? Why can't I just hire this paraprofessional to, to, to do handwriting practice? So capacity building is really about clearly defining our roles and our the unique expertise that we bring to this setting to improve that satisfaction of our clients. Of, and, and again, not just the individual student, but also that system um, that we're working with. And then we just wanted to offer, um, if, if we spent a whole day with you, we, we do a, a whole um, activity where we start taking some of this, breaking it down and giving you an opportunity to think about how do I apply this to me now? So what um, we would encourage you to take some time and reflect and think, okay, what does capacity building mean for me right now in my practice, in the school district, with the students that I'm serving? And then think about potentially, you don't have to use this exact format, but creating some sort of action plan or some sort of next step. Um, and maybe, and it could even be around a particular topic. So when in this journal that will be issue that will be coming out where we did some of this, one of the things that we showed was that you could read an article, one of the articles was on um, coaching. So you could read an article on coaching and then you could develop your own action plan for change if you decided you wanted part of your capacity building is to build more coaching into the services that you're providing. And so taking some um, opportunity to, to think as you're building these knowledge translation pathways to think about what are some of the outcomes you want set some dates for yourself to reach those outcomes and think about some steps and what you might need to be able to do to, um, to do that. And again, it does, this doesn't have to be a huge big project. You can start with one simple thing like a particular intervention strategy or a team strategy, or maybe your action plan for change is to read a journal article um, a month, or maybe your action plan is to um, make connections with other team members to and other stakeholders in your school to more deliberately talk about um, the services that you're providing and your capacity for um, really um, best meeting the needs of the students that you're serving. But we do want to encourage you to take some time to reflect on 
how would you apply some of this? What would it look like um, for you? So, because what we're really wanting to get to is what is your story? You know, what are the gaps in the evidence-based practice that you really need to think about addressing? Or who is your team? Or what pathway will you adopt and adapt to meet um, your practice and team needs? Um, what do you need to do to be able to change practice, either for you personally or for you for with, within the context of a school or a system that you're working within? Um, but really be thinking about how can you build your story as, as a practitioner? We should be continuing to evolve and continuing to refine our practice. Um, when we have our um, slides are uploaded, the handouts are uploaded for you, we do have um, quite a number of references around um, knowledge translation, professional decision-making, reflection, um, different types of um, um, articles that might help support your thinking around some of this. But we did really want to leave a chunk of time for some discussion or questions, thoughts, reflection, um, because one of the things that we found in this journey is that taking some time to really reflect, taking some time to really think about what we're learning is what lead, is the number one thing that will lead to changes in our um, practice. So comments, reflections. Or lots of information really fast and so your brains are all swimming. Curious to know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly learning a little bit more and more about your ECHO program and, and the ways that you are coming together to, to train, but what are some of the other facilitators in your school divisions that really enable you to, to um, you know, to support the translation of knowledge among your team members? You know, um, this is Gail. I, um, I'm, I'm wondering if you have a story that you can tell us um, about a, a person or a, or a team of therapists or somebody like that that could that used your knowledge translation and capacity building approach to make a change. Um, in their system. And that may be an unfair question to ask a presenter, but I'm thinking you do because you have lots of uh, in-school experiences and practical knowledge. Yeah, a, a story that comes to mind for me um, is I is a, is a story about a child that I was um, working with in a, in, um, elementary school. Um, she was an immigrant, her family were immigrants to the country, and they moved to the United States from um, a South American country <coughs> for the, <coughs> excuse me, um, for the express purpose of getting medical care. Um, and so they, they sort of left their home, they had no, um, you know, sort of no connections in the United States outside of the medical team that they had um, formulated a relationship with. And the child's condition was, was um, very, very unusual. There were no really very little um, information in, um, you know, available in the evidence to really kind of help us figure out what her trajectory was going to look like, what are, you know, what we needed to be concerned about in terms of, of interventions, um, it's a very kind of, um, you know, neuromuscular um, condition that we didn't, we saw, um, we saw decline in her um, progress over time, but didn't really fully understand. So, um, so there were a lot of dimensions to this child and her family and the school team um, that we really needed to understand, when you really needed to um, understand more fully. So, we use the knowledge translation pathway to really help us figure out what are all of the things we need to be concerned about. Um, so the first thing we did was we spent some time 
um, thinking about other students with, neuro, with uh, other kinds of neuromuscular conditions. We kind of um, evaluated and took stock in our own knowledge and skills of working with children with um, those kinds of um, challenges. And we also spent some time as a team thinking about, okay, what, where are the gaps? What do we need to know? What do we need to understand more fully about working with a child that, whose condition we didn't fully understand and who had very little in the way of resource um, kind of coming into the system? So we spent a lot of time initially sort of on those first two steps, our own reflection um, and our reflection of, among our team. Um, and then we spent some time really thinking about the family, um, the family's needs. Again, um, they were the, new to the country. They didn't speak the language. The only connections were to their medical community. And, um, and so we started to really think about in order for this family to be successful and this, for this child to be successful in this setting, what, what were the resources that they were going to need? Um, and so we were able to really kind of parse out and sort of think about all of the resources, all the way from um, access to, to adaptive equipment, things that the, that, that child would need at home, um, family resources to social services and things like that. So we got all of those pieces. We tried to kind of put together in collaboration with their medical team, um, all the resources that they were going to need for this child to be successful in school. Um, um, but, and then, you know, and then again, sort of thinking about the, the environment, we thought about, okay, what is that classroom going to need in order to really fully support this child? So we got services um, on board for, to support her language acquisition, um, to support her positioning and, uh, you know, access and resources in the classroom. And then again, you know, and then finally the, you know, kind of following across the, my, my thinking here across the, um, that arc that Yvonne talked about, you know, the evidence, we didn't have a lot of evidence to pull from. Um, so we tried to find sort of the best available evidence that we could use to help understand more completely the, um, the situation that was going on with the child. So, so just as Yvonne said, like, I just described that in a sequence, um, it didn't necessarily happen like that in real time. Um, I think that there were a bunch of, you know, conversations going on here or there. But I, but, but one thing that we really stuck to is thinking about what are each of those things? What are each of those kind of criteria that we need to be thinking about as we formulate a plan for her? And, um, and it really worked. I mean, I think, you know, as it, as it turned out, she does have a progressive um, neuromuscular disease, um, but she's doing well I and mean, she's learning, she's participating, she's engaging, she's happy, family is happy. Um, we are happy because we know we're providing the best services as possible. Thank you. Then I see Brittany's question about um, some of the social media outlets or others that are trying to bridge a gap between evidence and practice. You know, um, I talk to my students a lot about what I call fads and trends. There's a lot of fads and trends out there, and um, some of them are really good. And, you know, I think sometimes as um, there's in both OT and PT world, there's a therapist that's um, kind of figured out a protocol that's really worked for them. And then they, they um, start marketing it and trying to get everybody and having everybody else use it. Mm -hmm. I think you should consider it, look at it, but then I think you should, you sh that's where you put on your hat and you critically appraise it and think about it. Um, I often think about it also in terms of how the um, Department of Ed has defined um, promising and emerging practices. So if um, somebody comes out with this new handwriting program or a new way to, uh, to address a particular or teach a particular skill or a new sensory strategy, um, it might be a promising and emerging practice. So if you decide that you want to try and use it, I think you should be using data and you should be determining, you're almost doing a single subject research project of one then, right? So you're determining if it um, works for that particular client. 
And if you kind of use that arc that we've presented, then, you know, you'd be reflecting, do you think it's going to work in your practice? Is it something I want to try? There's that me, myself. Yes. Okay. What clients do I have on my caseload that I'd want to use this intervention or this um, um, particular strategy with? And it, does it fit? Is it in align with their goal? Does it fit with the, my team? Um, how does my team feel about it? Is it realistic? I, um, again, if you've heard me talk, you know that I do not believe OT should be handwriting teachers. I know there's a lot of OTs that do some handwriting activities. I think there's a place where we support handwriting. But again, another one of my big bugaboos is when, hand, when an OT is using one type of handwriting approach during um, a therapy session and the school district has a whole different approach that they use. And so then these kids sometimes feel like they're learning two <laughs> different strategies. So that team piece is really important. If you're gonna bring in a new strategy, does it fit within that environment, fit with your team? Is it realistic to be able to um, be able to use? Um, if you're using, you know, if your school district is using zones of regulation to talk about um, self-regulation and um, tying it into social emotional learning, even though there's lots of advantages to how does your engine run, I don't think OT should bring, bring that into that school, right? So, I, I mean, I think those, those are some things because we want to be thinking about our environment, thinking about the context. And then um, is there any research that's supporting that? And if not, to really think through how to do that. Yep, and the SET is another great framework. Um, Debbie, you're right. So the SET framework, the student environment tasks and tools that, um, that's been, that um, that's out of Wisconsin. That was part of the work out of Wisconsin, no? No, Joy Zavala. Joy Zavala, thank you. Um, and originally applied with AT, I've actually used that a little bit in, in other areas too. What does the student need? Where, what environment in, are they in? What are those tasks and tools that they wanna be able to do? And that could be another way to evaluate some of those different strategies that are available to us. And, I, and I, I'll just add the word of caution because I do think we really wanna carefully think through some of these. And if some of you have been in practice for a while, if you can think back to when all those cover, colored overlays came out to help with reading, do people remember that? Or facilitated communication is another one that came out and it was a practice trend and everybody should do it. It was a hard push. School districts spent lots of money on both of those um, practice trends that were then eventually shown through the evidence to not have the efficacy that was, was a proponent. So I guess my other comment would be to, to proceed with caution, but certainly evaluate them. I mean, there, there are some great ideas out there. And I think I, I could add to that, Yvonne, um, that idea of proceeding with caution. Um, the tool, the best tool that we have available to us um, around proceeding with caution is our, is our data. You know, so I think, um, and we, you know, kind of in that arc and looking at that client piece, that child, that student piece involves really being deeply attentive to how are we collecting data? What are the, what are the specific measures that we're looking at? What are those, um, those components of their, of their progress that we want to be paying attention to? And how are we collecting data about those particular metrics and then um, how are we making decisions about that? Um, so I think, you know, I, I agree with Yvonne that there is a lot of stuff out there and there's, you know, I can't keep up with it. Um, and sometimes I see st something on social media and I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, how have I missed this all these years? Um, but, um, so, you know, so some of it is, is really great. Um, but I think all of it, including those things that are published in, you know, in reputable journals and whatever, they require that we spend the time to think about how does this fit uniquely with our own practice, the practice of our team, the needs of our client, um, and our, our environment. And I think when we do that work, we, we land in a good place, um, whether, you know, in, for what, where, whatever the source is. So uh, we are out of time um, and I can tell that we could go on and have some really interesting discussions 
um, in the future. We're thrilled that you're coming back next time uh, to talk about quality indicators. I'm really interested in, in what you'll find with that. Um, I, I want to say thank you to both of you for sharing your knowledge and uh, translating some of it for us today. Uh, and um, I don't know, Deb, do you have anything else for the for the good of the order or 